Hey everybody and welcome to Bits of Board, where we're talking board games, miniatures, cards and dice. My name's Michael and today we continue on our journey through Kingdom Death Monsters campaign. Last episode we took on the hand and it was an epic fight. I'm already looking forward to taking him on again. Now this episode we're taking it back a peg and we're gonna have some fun with the Screaming Antelope. He is a regular favourite for me thanks to that amazing loot drop that he has at the end far out. Um, now, last ep, I may have uh, suggested that we were still in Lantern Year 13 at that stage because I thought it was a Nemesis encounter and this is not the first time that I've done that either. But we are actually moving forward a Lantern Year which means we have to do the settlement phase properly. So I'm going to start with that, we're going to swing through that really quickly and then we're going to dive into that hunt. <sighs> Let's do it guys. All right, thanks to my vagueness last episode, I decided that that was a special showdown that we had with the hand and went back to update the death count going through um, like it was a special showdown and not a real Lantern Year advancement, but I was completely wrong and I've done this before. We are now in Lantern Year 14. So we go back to the very top and I'm just gonna run through this super quickly so we don't waste too much time here. So our survivors return and we gain endeavors. We had four returning survivors, so we gain four endeavors. Now, we kind of lost a survivor, but I don't think it counts as a death for our uh, graves. The hand did reduce our population, but it mentioned no actual death there. So we just get the four here, and we go ahead and update the timeline. Being in Lantern Year 14, the good news is we don't actually have to do too much. We're just going to be drawing one settlement, oops, settlement event card. We've got Clinging Mist. The settlement is hidden behind a thick green mist. Something about the way the lantern light passes through it makes it seem alive. Roll 1d10. All right, looks like bad things happen on a one to three and good stuff on a four plus, hopefully. Let's roll and see what we get. A four, just scraping in there. First off, does the settlement have ammonia? We certainly do. So we have our yes here. Nominate a survivor to douse themselves in urine and run through the settlement, clearing the mist away. They gain plus three understanding, but minus one permanent luck for being so gross. <laughs> All right, so three understanding for minus one luck. That's not so bad. Um, oh, I have the perfect survivor for this. Dorian, a few hunts ago, picked up the apathetic uh, disorder. Where is the card for that? All right, now this card is essentially a big, massive pain in the butt. You've given up, nothing seems to matter, you have no concern for your own well-being. Well, as a result, you cannot use or gain survival. You cannot gain courage. All this sucks, but you can cure this disorder once you have eight or more understanding. Now, Dorian's currently on three, so this extra three will get him well on his way to curing this disorder. So I vote he gets it and that minus one to luck. All right, two more points of understanding and he is cured. Fantastic, lovely event there. Let's continue on. We update the death count. Well, we kind of did have a death, but it was just due to population loss. So I'll just mark that in. And we've done all the rest. We've um, developed, what did we get? Some Phoenix armors and, oh, we've actually got endeavors now. This is cool. Um, great, let's spend some of this stuff. Oh, I had my heart set on the shrine extra armor there, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. Um, we're fighting a level two screaming antelope and I don't think we'll have any issues there. So let's keep that out of there and let's spend our endeavors some other way. I'm wondering if we can innovate. Yep, we certainly will be. Um, I have one endeavor up there. I'm cashing in a phoenix finger, a monster hide and a monster organ, and we are going to innovate. All right, so we got, as usual, we're going to be drawing our four here. Picking one, we have drums, hovel, sacrifice, and scarification. Now, scarification is a bit of a gamble. Once per lifetime, gain plus one courage and roll the hit location die and you'll suffer some either good stuff or bad stuff. I think it's a 50-50 chance of stuff happening here. So that's kind of cool. We have sacrifice. Um, we have a death ritual. So you reduce your population, another kind of gamble thing. All right, so 
I, I don't think I want that yet. We still don't have that surplus of survivors here. Uh, we have drums here. We can spend an endeavor for bone beats. Uh, you can either gain insanity, survival, or the rhythm chase of fighting art, which is pretty boss, uh, or the synchronized strike secret fighting art. Uh, and then we've got hovel, which increases our survival limit, and we gain plus one survival on departing. Now this, I kind of want to get this one because I think hovel can lead to, is it the family principle? Anyway, there is a, uh, there's an innovation that can come up, and I think it's because of this, that will allow us to pass on weapon specializations, which I think we're going to need. Yep, let's go hovel. All right, so we'll add that into our, uh, our deck here. Of course, feel free to chime in if you think I'm doing the complete wrong thing with our innovation deck. Uh, for the moment though, that is what we're sticking with. So we've got three other endeavors to spend. We could try our luck at gaining some more understanding for Dorian. We could also give those uh, founders eyes a shot to gain uh, more population. I think I'd really prefer it if we got uh, at least two drops in the founders eye. So let's, uh, Ooh, we have hovel now. Yeah, all right. Let's let's uh, let's go for face painting for the time being. Now we do have the love juice, so we're not gonna have to spend an endeavor to intimacy, which is excellent. Puck is going to go to face painting to apply some founder's eye, I hope. Let's aim for that four plus. An eight, excellent. So we're gonna be able to add plus one to the roll on the intimacy table there. Let's go again. Another four plus, please. Oh, no good. And one more, come on, we want two here. A seven, excellent. So that's that done. We're gonna cash in our love juice. Puck is gonna have an intimacy event and I think we're gonna send Freya as well. All right, so Puck and Freya on the intimacy roll here. Uh, because of the way that we built our settlement, we have to roll two dice here and uh, choose the lowest result. That's why we've spent so many endeavors at the face painting thing. We can add two to each of these rolls. So let's hope for the best here, guys, come on. All right, that is why we cash in those endeavors. This two becomes a four, and unfortunately we don't get to use that 10, but with our four, a new survivor is brought kicking and screaming into the world. The child's eyes are free from the ink that stained the founder's faces. The settlement gains plus one population. Whew. All right, with all our development out of the way, we prepare our departing survivors and head off for the hunt. Let's do it. All right, first survivor out, we have Ceres. She is a brand new survivor, and as such, she doesn't have much flavor to her just yet. So we're gonna spice things up by breaking the norm. We haven't got a full set of screaming armor here. We've actually lost the uh, the horns, I think the helm, and we're including the Phoenix helm. We're gonna test out this ability. If the survivor is insane at the start of the showdown, gain plus one evasion token. Now, Ceres will be insane thanks to her screaming leg warmers boosting her insanity by three and those stone noses over there. Not much else to see as uh, she does have uh, full affinities required for the antelope mask. We've got two red and one blue, two blue there. So she's gonna have an extra movement activation every turn and we have it deadly over there on the scrap sword. Should be fun. All right, next up we've got Eva and she has a ton going on. So I'm just gonna try and fly by hers really quick. We have the connected affinities on the rawhide vest, which grant an additional evasion. We've got two blue affinities on the gear grid. So we gain plus one luck. She's got Orator of Death, which allows her to spend an activation to gain two insanity for all non-deaf survivors on the field. She's got Monster Claw Style, which grants her fist and tooth attacks, plus one accuracy, plus one strength, and Savage, which allows her to knock off an additional wound if she can wound with the critical roll. And for her, that is going to be an eight, a nine, or a 10, thanks to her plus one luck and the fact that she has Deadly with fist and tooth. She's also got the Red Fist Secret Fighting Art, which grants her and all her other survivors a plus one strength token and the ability to spend plus one strength tokens in place of survival. 
She's of course got rawhide armor, the full set going on here, which means she has a good chance of gaining any spent survival back. Now she's got Quixotic, which means if she's insane when she departs, she gains plus one survival and plus one strength. Now, unfortunately, she's not going to be insane on departing. She will be on arrival thanks to those stone noses, but yeah, departing is a no-go, so Quixotic is not gonna fire off. She's also got Weak Spot, which is a uh, disorder she gained from the See the Truth story event. Now, she gained a ton of stuff throughout that, so we're, uh, we'll cover those mostly in a sec. But what I wanted to do here is resolve this, because we never did back in the day. Weak spot is you have an imaginary infirmity. When you gain this disorder, roll a random hit location and record it. You cannot depart unless you have armor at this hit location. So let's roll now for that. And it's the chest armor there. So as long as she's got something covering her chest, like the rawhide vest there, she's able to depart. So that's really good. Now there were a couple of other things she gained from that See the Truth event. Some of them great, not all of them so though. She is partially blind, which dropped her accuracy down to one. Her base stats are going to be one accuracy, five strength, and two evasion, which means she's going to be strong and hard to hit, I'll tell you that. On top of blind, she also gained the, uh, the sweet battle ability, which gives her a free surge every round. She's going to be attacking so often. This is going to be so good for us. Now, she also gained a pretty solid ability during our uh, principal conviction uh, story event, and that was for Master the Darkness. She gained the Thundercaller ability, which allows us to kind of skip a random event that we come across after the overwhelming darkness space. Uh, unfortunately, because we are hunting a level two screaming antelope, it doesn't look like we're actually going to get to that. Uh, there are no random hunt events back there. So we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but it looks to be a pretty cool ability. It just means we've got to keep her alive until then. <laughs> All right, next up we have another new survivor and this is Dis. Now he's not got too much going on on the gear grid. Um, we're playing with the Hunter's Whip and the Leather Shield and a full set of leather armor here. We've got the bandages as a just in case and the Cat Eye Circlet again as a just in case. He does have a plus one strength token thanks to Eva's Hands of Heat and of course the usual plus two strength and plus one evasion uh, that we gain from our principles and innovations. Innovations. Not too much going on, but thought it'd be a good idea to bring on another new survivor just to start building up that hunt XP. And lastly, we've got Rain. Now she's working on the dagger specialization. Currently we've got one point there, but I don't want to be left in a lurch just in case we need some range support. So she's rocking the arc bow as well. Now we've got some connected affinities on the white line boots here, granting us plus one movement. We've also got one point of strength, thanks to the monster tooth necklace, but we also gain an additional strength token, thanks to our affinities on the board there. She's got the monster claw style fighting art, which I doubt we'll be using, uh, but we've also got the double dash, which gives us a little bit more movement flexibility as well. During your act, once per round, you may spend an activation to gain a movement activation. So that's pretty solid. Now, as far as stats go, she's got the usual plus two strength and one to evasion, but she's also got an additional point in speed, which will make her pretty solid with that arc bow. Super strong weapon, it'll be nice to have an additional role there. Again, this is more about building up the abilities of some of our uh, other survivors, prepping them up for the tougher encounters later on down the track. But yeah, we should have some fun here. Oh, almost forgot an additional strength token thanks to the red fist fighting art. All right, onward towards darkness. We have the antelope nice and far away. Where? Oh, there. There he is, nice and far. Let's see if I can wind this back up, there we go. Nothing much to do here except move onwards down the track. So we begin with our very first Screaming Antelope event for today, Vomit Pile. The survivors find the half-digested remains of their quarry's last meal. Each survivor may scavenge, gain plus one courage, and roll on the table. Ooh, all right. Nice way to gain some courage here. Now it looks like the only negative to come out of this is if we roll a one to a four, 
uh, we will need to archive all consumable gear. I haven't given any consumable gear today, so this will actually be pretty good for us. Um, I think we'll roll with everybody, even though Eva has full courage, we might still be able to take a resource out of this. Let's do it. So we'll begin with this up the top here, a one archive all consumable gear. Nothing bad there, we don't have anything to archive and we do gain plus one courage, so that's cool. Next up, we'll do Eva down here. A four, archive all consumable gear. That's annoying, she doesn't have anything to archive. Would gain one courage, but we're already full, so not to worry. We'll go serious over here. Come on, something, yes, eight is good. Uh, you find something undigested and eat it. Gain plus one survival. That'll take her up to the full six survival, awesome. All right, and last but not least, we have a rain over here, let's roll. A nine, all right. That's the good one. The antelope is clearly sick, vomiting up pieces of itself. <laughs> Gain plus one understanding and one random screaming antelope resource. And we gain a large flat tooth, awesome. Now, if no one was to scavenge, we'd roll on the random hunt table there, um, but we scavenged all of us, so let's move on. We come to our first random event. Let's roll, see what we get. Number 28. A rumpled, unsightly bird stands in the survivor's path. Its beady, wet eyes blink expectantly and it calls out with an eerie human chuckle. The survivors may archive one consumable item or gear, offering it to the troll bird. If any survivor is insane, they must feed the troll bird if able. If they feed the troll bird, it hops off with a terrible cackle. If they don't feed the troll bird, it follows the survivors on their hunt, constantly mocking them with its chuckle. Roll 1d10. If any survivor has the coprolalia disorder, they curse the bird and make vigorous and vulgar gestures. The bird is impressed. Add plus three to the roll. All right, so we don't have anything to offer it, so we're gonna be rolling on the table there. Uh, who is going to be our event revealer? I'm thinking this, he's up the top here. So let's roll for it. All right, not great, not terrible though. The troll bird makes a terrible racket, alerting the monster. All survivors gain plus one understanding. At the start of the showdown, the monster ambushes the survivors. Oof. Good news is though, plus one understanding. That brings rain up to the first inside event, cool. Alright, so this is a hunt phase epiphany. You dream. Before you toiling silently, a strange creature with the imprint of a human face sculpts stone faces into the ground. You meet its concave gaze and wake. Gain the following ability and roll on the hunt table. Explore. When you roll on an investigate table, add plus two to your results. Love it. Let's roll and see what bonuses we get out of that. A six. Gain plus three survival and plus three insanity. Nice. Well, she's well and truly insane now. <laughs> All right, we get that one out of the way and let's move to our next uh, Screaming Antelope event. Devoured grounds. The stone face ground is littered with the leavings of ravenous passing beasts. Half eaten arcanthus plants are strewn everywhere. If any survivor has plus three understanding, the survivors may skip the next hunt space. And thanks to Rain gaining her third understanding, we can move on straight past this one here. Love it. So we shuffle on through and move into our next random event. Let's roll, see what we get. 11. All right, so let's move it on down the line. I'm thinking Ceres will be our event revealer here. Monster droppings. The survivors find some monster droppings like those of their quarry. The event revealer chooses to either investigate or consume the, the droppings, gross. If the event revealer investigates, gain plus one understanding and roll one D10. Ew. Now, Ceres is insane. Not by much, but I'm thinking she's going to eat the poo. 
it might be gross, but there might be rewards here. So let's uh, let's give it a shot. <laughs> oh dear. All right, so we're gonna be rolling on the table here. Let's see how we go. Right, roll first, show you after. Oh, it is a 10. We've rolled well. Boy, did we nail this. All right. There was something quite special about the feces. Gain plus one speed and plus one strength token. Awesome. We also gain plus one courage for eating the feces. Hells yeah. All right, so our survivors move in to overwhelming darkness. All right, it's that time again. Uh, we have two insane survivors walking the path of the insane. Rain and Ceres will both be rolling on this table here. Eva has three plus courage, so she'll be walking the path of the brave. And Dis, they're going to be walking the path of the doomed. We begin with Rain. A four. You shriek and lash out. All survivors suffer one event damage to a random hit location. All right, this gets one to the waist. Eva, one to the chest. Ceres, one to the legs. And Rain, one to the chest as well. Next, Ceres walks the path of the insane. A four. She too shrieks and lashes out, dealing one event damage. Dis again, one to the head. Uh, um, um, um. Eva next. Oh crap. Oh, sorry, Eva. <laughs> Might get a sub for that. I've got to stop rolling dice near these guys. Seriously. Eva's obviously dead. Um, let's find out what she gets. Was that? Oh, I'll just roll again. One to the waist, right. Ceres to the hands and rain to the waist. Right, they are our insane survivors done. Let's go for Dis, who's walking the path of the doomed. Gonna roll one d10, hope for something decent. A three. You glimpse a nightmare whale swimming overhead. Your heart shrivels, lose half your survival rounded down and gain the post-traumatic stress disorder. All right, PTSD. The last hunt was harrowing. All you can do is cower and relive the trauma. Only time can heal your wounds. Next settlement phase, you do not contribute or participate in any endeavors. Skip the next hunt to recover. We'll have to remember that. Lastly, poor Eva. She walks the path of the brave. All right, let's roll for her. A four as well. A massive whale swims overhead. Your guts quiver with its booming cries. You vomit in fear, but keep brave face. Gain minus one evasion token. After this event, all other survivors gain plus one survival from your bold display. All right, that means we are done at the overwhelming darkness event. All right, guys and gals, we have Eva back in play now, and I think we're all done with our overwhelming darkness. So let's move in to our final, hopefully, hunt event before the Screaming Antelope. And we have Grazing Field. Arcanthus leaves sprout from the crevices in the stone ground. The survivors spend time gathering and eating the small leaves. Each survivor may heal one hit location of their choice, restoring all injury levels and armor points. Awesome. Uh, if any survivor has a sickle, they gain one fresh Arcanthus strange resource. This is excellent because we suffered a few wounds hanging around in that uh, overwhelming darkness. So we'll just uh, fix a couple of them up. And then we're gonna be rolling a random hunt event. And I think, all right, here is our principal conviction. Uh, we mastered the darkness way back while 
And um, this is that ability that I was talking about before. Nominate a survivor, they gain four plus courage. This was Eva, by the way. And they gain the following ability, Thundercaller. Once a lifetime, on a hunt board space after overwhelming darkness, in place of rolling a random hunt event, use 100 as your result. We're about to roll a random hunt event, and I think that means we can go ahead and use the Thundercaller ability, right? This is amazing. So we're not going to do the grazing field random hunt event there at the end. Let's find number 100. This is exciting. Oh gosh, this is ominous. The finale. An enormous metallic sound rings out from a distance. All survivors are electrified with dread. They suffer two brain event damage. Wow. All right, hang on. Okay. The survivors may follow the sound, otherwise they panic and retreat in the opposite direction. End this event and move the survivors two spaces back on the hunt board. Well, we're here, we may as well follow the sound. Each survivor gains plus one courage and gingerly approaches the sound's origin. As they travel, they pass the shattered corpses of strange beasts. If any survivor has three or more understanding, they follow the trail of corpses. Otherwise, harvest three random basic resources from the corpses and end this event. So Rain has that three plus understanding. We're in, guys. Uh, arriving at a massive anvil, the survivors see a giant one-eyed knight, its charcoal-colored armor reflecting their lantern light. The event revealer rolls 1d10. Look at this monster of a thing. That is the beast that stands before us. All right, Eva, you've suffered plenty at the hands of this hunt and you brought us here so you can be our event revealer. All right, um, all right, so we don't want a one here. We get a six. It's not enough to get the, uh, the big nine plus there. Uh, what have we got though? The knight approaches the survivor. In an instant, it chops off a random survivor's ear. They gain one bleeding token, then it strikes the anvil, blinding the survivors with a churning wall of sound. When they open their eyes, the knight is gone, and the steel sword and steel shield rare gear rest in its place. The group divides the gear between them. This is phenomenal. <laughs> Let's, um... All right, firstly, who is our random survivor that gets a chopped off ear? We've got our randomizer cards here. Let's go for gold. <laughs> Hopefully it's not Eva, she's already partially blind. And it's going to be Rain. All right, so she's going to enter the showdown with a bleeding token. That's not so bad. Um, let's, let's take a look at this gear, guys. All right, here we are. This is pretty cool. So our steel sword, uh, it is a speed one weapon, hits on a four plus with five strength behind it. It has irreplaceable, slow, and sharp. On a perfect hit, the edge sharpens. Gain one d10 strength for the rest of the attack. And the steel shield. Now, if we use this as a weapon, it has one speed, six plus hits, and six strength behind it. Massive weapon here. It's irreplaceable, minus three to movement when you got it, and you may spend an activation or one survival to ignore a hit. That is pretty dang cool. Um, we've just got to find people to hold on to it. Um, this might be hard because I think we've got all four gear grids full at the moment. So someone is going to have to drop something. In fact, two things are going to go. You know what? We're lucky enough to have two sets of stone noses in the crowd here. So Ceres and Eva can drop their stuff and we'll pass on these wonderful pieces of gear. We're going to give Ceres the steel shield. She currently doesn't have a shield, so she will totally dig this. And then Eva, she can have the steel sword, although I doubt she's going to be using it this showdown. She's just too good with that fist and tooth. All right, that is it. Let's send our survivors in. We're going to be attacking the screaming antelope.
All right, guys, so a pretty standard setup for our screaming antelope up there. We do have the nightmare tree on the board, though, and some debris. Other than that, though, there's the debris, by the way. Uh, other than that, though, we've got the usual, you know, mess of Arcanthus plants, and our bug spot is on the left-hand side this time. Usually I stick it up there on the right. Now, before we go on, uh, one or two things. We did gain this uh, focus large flat tooth before, and I forgot to give someone insanity, so let's do that now. We'll give it to Eva, just in case. And also, I filmed the gear grid stuff before I did the hunt event. So the fact that we didn't end up using an Endeavor at the shrine means um, everyone is essentially down one point of armor. So I've reflected that, and I think we're good to go now. Now we've faced this guy plenty of times, enough to know exactly what's going on. He has trample, which means if he collides, you suffer damage equal to the monster level. And he has diabolical, which you're gonna see very shortly um, what that does. He's got a plus one speed token, a plus one damage token. He's an all round dangerous, very movable kind of guy. And on top of that, he's ambushing us. <laughs> All right, so we begin the antelope's turn by drawing his first AI card, and what do we get? Stomp. Closest knockdown survivor. Nobody's knocked down. Furthest threat in field of view and in range. That is going to be Ceres over there, because, well, the antelope can't actually see rain over here. No. It has to be in range. Now, the antelope only has, what? Eight movement points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's not going to be able to get close enough to do any damage there. So, instead, he grazes, which means he moves to the closest Arcanthus plant and essentially heals. Now, I have set up slightly strategically that he moves forward and he'll chomp down on that one there. If he had any wounds, he would heal one wound, and that would be the end of his turn, if it were a level one. <laughs> we now check for that diabolical trait, this pain in the butt. At the end of the monster's turn, target a random survivor in the trample zone, and he's going to trample. Now, we don't have a target, so if the monster has no target, full move forward. Fantastic. So he's going to move forward eight spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right there. Now, of course, we ignore the tree for monster movement here. And I'm thinking, let's let's decorate this board up and chuck the, uh, the actual the model tree down. So be it if we need to move it again. All right. So that's the monster's first activation because we're ambushed. Of course, that's not going to be his last before we get a shot. So we draw the next card and it's Stomp and Snort. Random survivor in range. There are all four survivors are in range here. So let's randomize. All right. And it's going to be the Bastion lookalike. Who is that today? Dis. Wonderful. All right. So Dis is going to be targeted here. And it looks like he's going to get intimidated. The screaming antelope begins to stomp and snort excitedly. A gurgling moan sounds from its under mouth. Turn to face the target and roll 1d10. On a result of 4 plus, the target suffers 1 brain damage per monster level and is knocked down. In addition, if they are insane, they suffer knock back 5. Alright, so there's good news and bad news. The bad news is he uh, he has no insanity. The good news is he's not insane. If we roll that four or more, I don't think that's any consolation. Let's roll, hoping for the best. What have we got? A six. The target suffers one brain damage per monster level and is knocked down. Dang. All right, so we pop him down like that. We fill in his light injury box there on the brain and we are gonna have to roll for brain trauma. Now, thanks to our Accept Darkness principle, uh, we do pretty well at brain trauma rolls. So let's roll, see how we go. Oh, terrible. Thanks to Accept Darkness here, we add plus two to all brain trauma rolls. That brings us from a one up to a three, which means we lose two levels of weapon proficiency. This being brand new to the whole showdown thing, he doesn't have any. So we kind of get out scot-free there. Brilliant. He's not insane, so no knockback. We end the antelope's turn there. Once again, checking his diabolical trait. We have no survivors in his trample zone, so he's just gonna full move forward, which will bring him up in line with the board's edge. Time for a bit of payback, right? 
Let's start with Rain over here. She's going to move up two spaces here and then she's going to spend one point of her survival to gain that movement point back by dashing. She's down from seven to six. Next, she's going to pounce, which is the special ability of her white lion coat. We spend her activation and her movement to move three spaces in a straight line. Then if you moved three spaces, activate a melee weapon with plus one strength. One, two, three, standing right behind the antelope in that blind spot. We gain an additional strength and additional accuracy thanks to her gauntlets and for having the full set of white lion armor. She gains one speed and two strength tokens there. A massive haul, I absolutely adore using this attack. Now Rain has plus one speed naturally, so we are actually gonna be rolling five dice here. This is gonna be five dice on a five plus. How did we do? Not amazingly. Um, so our one, our one and our two don't actually hit there, but we do get a perfect hit, bringing our survival back up to seven. So we draw two hit locations. The first one is the Restless Flank, which has a reflex on it. And the next one is Restless Inner Thigh, which has a wound reflex on it. Both of these could be pretty sweet. Let's find out what we are rolling. Now the dagger itself has one strength, plus three strength for our pounce. Two strength for our monster tooth necklace. One strength for the hands of heat fighting art brought by Eva. And two natural strength. Wow. That's a total of nine strength. The screaming antelope only has a toughness of 10, which means we're going to be wounding each of these locations on anything except for a one. An eight for our first one here. So the restless eye, the monster turns to face the attacker. Nothing so bad, we discard our first wound. The restless inner thigh next. A five, so we do make that wound as well. This one has a wound reflex on it. Your attack disables the monster's powerful running muscles. The screaming antelope gains a minus one movement token. That is what we like. Now we're gonna surge and we are going to reduce our likelihood of actually hitting and actually wounding, but I like our odds. Or maybe I don't like our odds. It'd be four dice on a seven plus, because now that we're not in the blind spot. Yeah, let's not worry about that. We'll instead use that survival to have Dis stand up down here. He's now encouraged and all is well. Let's go series. She's going to move in over the side of the antelope here, attacking with that scrap sword. Whoa, thanks to her natural speed, she's going to be rolling an extra dice and she also gained a speed token during that hunt phase. This is going to be four dice, my lord. Four plus. One, two, three, four, and a perfect hit there as well. The edge sharpens on the blade and we gain plus four strength for this attack. This is brutal. The restless ear is our first one. The gnarled horns, our second. Restless back, our third. And the delicate inverted knee, our fourth. Oh my God, killing it here. With all of her strength combined, plus that bonus from the perfect hit, we have 10 strength, which means once again, anything except for a one. An eight. Now the delicate inverted knee has a little bit of text here. If you hit with a club or a shield, you club the monster and gain plus two luck. We're not, we're using a sword, so no bonus luck for us here, but we do get the wound. The next one is much the same. Um, yeah, almost exactly the same. Brilliant, let's roll. A one, oh, we actually missed this one. That's a shame. Let's hit those gnarled horns. A five. So this one here has a failure on it, so we do not have to worry about that. Instead, we just get that wound. Lastly, we have the restless ear, which has that club or shield effect, anything except for a one. We roll a six and bang, another wound. Guys, we are two activations in and we have five wounds. Whoa. I'm torn. I want to surge so we can just kill this guy, but I also want to get up there and grab some of these wonderful little bits and pieces up here. Oh, I should have. Oh, anyway, that's okay. Stuff it. Let's surge. Another four dice. Another four dice. Five plus. 
Ooh, one, two, three hits. Solid stuff there. The giant teeth. Super dense location. The restless hoof. And the furry tail. Let's just have a quick squeeze of these. The fairy tail, nothing to resolve on that. We do have a failure on the restless hoof. If attacking with a melee weapon, it is kicked out of reach by the screaming antelope's thrashing hooves. Spend an activation to retrieve your lost weapon before it can be used again. If fighting with fist and tooth, suffer the dislocated shoulder severe arm injury. Thank goodness we have a sword and giant teeth, super dense. If the attacker hits this location with a frail weapon, it is damaged. Archive the weapon at the end of this attack. Thankfully our scrap sword is not frail, so let's just go top down like that. Alright, so now we have a total of six strength because we don't get to count that plus four from the scrap sword. We're going to be wounding on fours here. A five, just sneaking in there, I saw that turn. Uh, the giant teeth wounds. Let's go the fairy tail. Oh, use this one. A nine. Oh. Yes, we have deadly, which means this is a critical wound. Gain one screaming antelope resource. The screaming antelope is off balance. The monster gains a minus one accuracy token. Add that in, gain a resource. What do we get? The beast steak, lovely. Lastly, we have that restless hoof. Let's see what we get. A three. Oh, oh crap. I think we fail that. No. <laughs> All right. So failure, if attacking with a melee weapon, we read this, uh, the weapon's knocked out of our hands and we can't attack again unless we spend that activation to get it. So I'm just gonna put this card as a reminder on top of the sword there, lovely. Now that Dis is on his feet, let's give him an attack as well. He has the Hunter Whip, three dice, six plus. Ooh, what do we got? A six, a nine, and a five. So just two hits there. Let's find out where. The restless chest and the restless rump. Oh, these are annoying. Um, we are going to roll. Okay, so these, these both suck because the first one, the restless rump here, turn the monster to face away from the attacker and full move forward in a straight line. Cancel all hits, now out of range. This happens whether we wound or not, which means he's going to knock Eva running into the corner there. This one here, turn the screaming antelope to face the attacker and full move forward in a straight line. That's going to be bang that way, well out of range of Eva. So let's roll for this restless rump here. We have a total of six strength, which means a four plus here. Seven, we do make the wound, that's great. Discard an AI card, but then we suffer the reflex. Turn the monster to face away from the attacker, bang, full move forward in a straight line, his movement is now seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He's still gonna make it to that board's corner there. And in that movement, Eva gets knocked down. Eva suffers two damage to a random hit location, being the legs. Now, Dis isn't going to uh, follow up with another attack. He's too far out of range. So he's just going to encourage Eva to stand, which will get her back in the game. All right, let's get in there with Eva. She's going to run over, and before she attacks, she's actually gonna spend her activation to harvest this uh, pile of debris here. We roll one dice. We get a six. Let's have a look. Find useful remains, gain one random basic resource, and archive this terrain. That one is done. And we gain a monster hide, lovely. Now that that's out of the way, we're going to surge to allow her to attack with that fist and tooth. Now she's got the rawhide gear full set, so we can roll to see if she gets her survival back. We need a six plus. A one ensures we do not, but that's good. Let's get those ones out of the way. This is going to be two dice hitting on a five plus. We get a six and an eight. So that is two hits there. Let's find out where. First one is the pallet, which has a failure on it, and then the restless shank that has a wound reflex on it. Oh, I don't like the look of that restless shank. The wound on this one is roll 1d10 for each survivor currently in the monster's blind spot. On a result of three plus, they are brutally 
back kicked and suffer three damage to a random hit location and knock back five. Uh, the pallet has a failure, the giant maw snaps shut. If you are adjacent to the monster, you must spend one survival to react quickly or suffer three damage to an armor location. This one's okay, let's begin there. We've got a total of seven strength here, which means we need a three plus to not get that failure. Three, ooh, scraping by there, fantastic. So we get the wound, don't have to resolve the fail. Don't have to resolve the failure. And next we have that Restless Shank. Really hoping for a critical wound here, guys. For us, because we have Deadly and a plus one luck token, we can do this on an eight, a nine, or a 10. A four, not quite good enough. So we do get the wound, I'll discard an AI card, but then roll one D10 for each survivor currently in the monster's blind spot. We want a one or a two here, guys. A nine, that's certainly not a one or a two. Where were you before? Eva suffers a massive back kick, knock back five. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, it doesn't actually look like she's knocked down. That's kind of cool. Um, but she does get three damage. Let's find out where. To the legs, ooh. Spoke too soon. That would give her a heavy wound. Nothing more, but that does mean she is knocked down. No more of that, thank you. I really should glue these back on. Even blue tack, seriously. Can I just say now, the reason I haven't done it is I kind of need to pin these survivors in and I wanted to cover up the scenes with that. Anyway, back to the game. <laughs> So as good as that first round was, we did a ton of damage. It is now time for the, uh, the antelope to activate. We'll start off by drawing his AI card. It's another stomp and snort. There must be a couple of these floating around. Random survivor in range. Let's figure out who. All right, we're gonna draw and the survivor is going to be one of these. Bang, this one. And it's, oh, it's gonna be Eva. Tops. Turn to face the target. That's not good. And roll 1d10 on a result of four plus, the target suffers one brain damage per monster level and is knocked down. Well, she does get that brain damage, in fact, two. Thankfully though, we're not gonna be rolling on that uh, brain trauma table just yet. All right, so that's the end of the uh, antelope's attack. So we resolve his diabolical, and yes, there are survivors in his uh, trample zone. So he's going to full move straight ahead. This is not good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, wow. Okay. All right, so the antelope ends up over here. Let me just move the camera. There he is. And he's actually on top of Eva here, who suffers now knockback five. One, two, three, four, five. Because that's collision, she suffers two damage to the waste location. There goes her armor there. All right, and that marks the end of the antelope's activation. So we kind of did well there. Uh, Eva's on the brink of having a leg chopped off, it looks like. Um, but that's it, it's back to the survivor's turn. Hey guys, so what are we doing over here? You might ask, I mean, Eva's knocked down and you know, the antelope's over there. Why aren't we fighting the antelope? Well. Thanks to Eva's fist and tooth specialization, she may stand if knocked down at the start of the monster's turn or the survivor's turn. So we're gonna have her stand up right about now. Now she's pretty happy with the way that the other survivors are working out out there and she's got her hit in with fist and tooth. So she's kind of gonna bail, yeah. And we're gonna send her up top here to possibly harvest some bugs. She's just gonna have a, take a bit of a break from the whole screaming antelope monster hunting thing. Now she has six movement, which is pretty, pretty useful right about now. We wanna get her up here so she can harvest both a bug and an arcanthus plant. So we'll start off with her first six movement. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Then we're gonna cash in a survival to dash. Of course, we'll roll to see if she gets that survival back, and she does not, but that's okay. We have plenty to spare. One, two, three, four, five, and we're right up there next to the Arcanthus and the bugs. Let's go take a closer look. Look at her, she's in her element up there. <sighs> so we're gonna spend her first activation, and we're going to try and harvest, let's go the bugs first. So we're gonna roll a dice for that. That's a bug patch, and we get a six. Here we go. On a four plus, we gain one random vermin resource and archive the terrain top stuff. 
All right, so we shuffle our vermin resources, and what do we get? Bang! Oh, you can't see that. It is a hissing cockroach. Uh, this is one of the ones. If we archive, uh, if we consume this, archive this to lose all survival and gain 2d10 insanity. Whoa! If you're insane, you must consume this. Thankfully, she's not insane, but far out, that's mental. All right, we'll add that to our uh, <laughs> our pile of gear there. And, um, well, I think we're gonna harvest a game. Now, we don't have to spend any survival for this one. Eva has that sweet battle trait, which gives her a free surge. Instead of using that to attack like awesome people, we're going to use that uh, surge to harvest instead. Oh, that's a shame we can't actually do that. The sweet battle surge can only be used for weapons. Oh, that's okay. We'll just use a regular surge. So we're going to spend some survival for this. Let's see if we get it back. A one? We do not. We are terrible at getting survival back. So let's roll to harvest this Arcanthus. Just the one dice here. We get a five. Mm. In doing that, we do, uh, we find something tasty uh, and consume it. If you do so, gain plus one survival and archive the terrain. It's a shame it's not a fresh Arcanthus, but survival is still pretty useful because, you know, we're chewing through it. All right, so that's it for uh, Eva's adventure in the, the wilderness there. She's gone a bit Bear grills and surviving. Uh, let's, let's return back to our survivors that are actually fighting a monster. Meanwhile, <laughs> um, let's, let's begin with... Rain, yeah. Um, and we're going to do our usual here. We're going to move her up and across, and then we're going to spend one point of survival to dash, gaining that movement point back. Then we're going to pounce, moving three spaces forward, and attacking. We gain all of our amazing tokens back for this one, and we're rolling five dice. This is just a fun one to do. Five dice, five plus. What do we get? Hit, hit. Hit. All right, so two misses amongst that. All right, we've got the giant tongue, the giant mouth, and the furry throat. So far, so good. Um, the furry throat, if you hit with a club or a shield effect, it would gain us luck. We don't have a club or a shield in there, or do we? Well, we're not attacking one, so that doesn't matter. The giant mouth has a reflex on it. If attacking with a melee weapon, and the wound roll for this location is a one or a two, the monster consumes your weapon. Uh, I kind of don't want that to happen. Um, I mean, it is just a dagger, but still. And then the giant tongue is a minus two toughness to wound this location. So let's, uh, let's go in that order there. So we have a total of nine strength, which means we're going to be wounding on anything except for a one for all of these. Let's just hope we aren't rolling ones or twos the whole way. All right, an eight to begin with. Solid stuff, we get the wound here. Blood and spittle erupt from the screaming antelopes wounded under more. If the wound roll is even, suffered one brain damage. If the wound result is odd, gain one insanity. Well, we do actually suffer a brain damage there, that kind of sucks. She's covered though, and she drops down to two insanity. Let's go to the furry throat. A three, we make the wound. And then we've got this giant maw where we just don't actually want to roll a one or a two. A six, yes. So no other effect in that one. We just discard, drop our wound off, and she has done very well. Now that brings us to the end of the Antelope's AI deck. Three cards in there. We will shuffle them up. Add them back in. We have two survivors left. Three wounds to go here. I'm fairly certain that we are going to have this down, done and dusted this round. So let's have some fun. Ceres is going to leave it to dis essentially here. Ceres is going to run up there and hopefully we're going to get some Arcanthus. <laughs> uh, it's going to take Probably, let me just count it out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If we're gonna get up next to it, she's got a movement of five, so this is gonna take her movement point and a survival to dash her way up there. One, two, three, four, five. We'll spend our survival dashing up. One, two, three, four, there we go. And let's go join her up there. There she is, having an absolute blast. Uh, this, I, 
Let's just make a Kingdom Death farming sim. How about that? Um, let's roll to see if she gets her Arcanthus or not. I need big six. No. Again, she's just consuming something tasty uh, and we gain that um, one survival back. Dang. Is it wrong that I kind of want to continue getting these Arcanthus? Um, all right, let's head back to see what Dis is going to do. All right, guys, let me let me level with you here. Dis is over here, and the tree is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces away. Would it be wrong if we risk another attack from this beast just so we can get some more harvesting done? I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Dis, what are you gonna do, mate? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's uh, let's head over here. It's gonna take one, two, three, four, five, one survival. Bang, all the way over here, and uh, we're going to roll for the nightmare tree because there's always things to harvest. Hey, a lantern tanner. Where was that before? Um, we only needed a six plus here. Find decorative scrap. Gain one broken lantern. There is our broken lantern resource. I'll just toss that into the pile. And yeah, we are uh, we're in the antelope's activation now. What is the fairy beast going to do? It's a stomp. Closest knockdown survivor. No one's knocked down. Furthest threat in field of view and in range. It's going to be Dis. He moves over. Seven, one, two, three, four, five. Definitely in range there. This is going to be a speed two attack and it's gonna be hitting on fours. What do we got? A six and a seven, so that's gonna be two hits. Let's find out where. Oh, two the hands, I don't like that. These would both be three damage a piece. And um, you know what? We can actually take both of them. I don't know if I want to. Give us a light wound, huh? All right, let's, let's take it. He's only got one survival left, so we'll take those damage. All right, and now we check his Diabolical. We have two survivors in the Trample Zone. Let's grab their cards. One for Dis, one for Rain. Let's figure it out. I'm gonna look away, close my eyes, shuffle back and forth. Hopefully I've forgotten I have. And it's going to be Dis that gets hit there. Not ideal for me. So we full move ahead. Now that's going to be tricky. One, two, three, four, five, six, six all the way up here on the other side of our tree. Now Dis is of course knocked down here and he'll suffer two damage to a random location to the head. Ow! But the good news is we're back to the survivor's activation. All right, um, Rain's just hanging out down here. So one, two, three, four, five. We're going to send her up next to the nightmare tree as well. And she too is going to attempt to harvest there. Each survivor may uh, use this roll once per showdown. So let's see what she gets. A four. Oh, she gets tangled in hairy grass and is knocked down. Bummer. That's all right. They're just having a bit of a lie down there. <laughs> oh, well. Let's go see what Ceres is doing. Ceres just hanging out there. Now she, of course, has to spend an activation before she's like able to attack thanks to that restless hoof uh, failure. We'll do that in just a sec for the moment. One, two, three, four. We're going to move her to this lovely piece of our canvas here, and we're gonna roll and hopefully, hopefully, come home with some fresh our canvas. Let's roll, see how we go. Oh, big roll and a big number. Let's just move over. If you can see, see if I can zoom in a little. That is a nine. Wonderful work there. And we do gain that fresh Arcanthus, recouping our losses from that horrible event where we lost half of our resources. There we go. Fresh Arcanthus back in stock. Now we're not gonna be doing any attacks right about now, but I do want to go home with my weapon and I don't want to be caught out on a technicality that I didn't gather my weapon back. So we'll spend our activation to recover the weapon lost by the antelope's thrashing hooves, all sorted there. All right, Eva, what you gonna do? Harvest. Just one. Let's roll, see what she gets. A one. That's not ideal at all. Um, that's terrible, okay. On the one, something bites you, you suffer one arm damage, archive this terrain. Terrible, 
down to two armor there. Let's attack. Let's get this over and done with. We're going to move Eva into the blind spot there. Two dice, four plus. Five and a five, that is two hits there. Exactly what we need. Oh no. Oh, how did I know that was gonna happen? Okay. The Wailing Slide, we did score a trap card here. The Screaming Antelope panics, its undermouth unleashing an inhuman wail. It bucks wildly and leaps into the air. The attacker is doomed. All survivors adjacent to the monster suffer two brain damage per monster level, knock back five, and are knocked down. That's gonna be Eva, of course. She gets knocked back against the tree here. Just gonna get some damage for that. Damage to the hand and two brain damage. Oh, that means we're gonna be rolling for brain trauma. No! All right, big numbers, big numbers, big numbers. Five, what do we get? That goes up to a seven. We do survive, gain a random disorder and one D5 insanity. Let's find out how much insanity she gets. Uh, that will be two insanity. And let's find out what disorder she gets. And we get, what is that, Coprolalia. I've read this before for an effect for something else. Uh, you have compulsive tics in the form of sporadic muttering, cursing, whimpering, and screaming. All your gear is noisy. You are always a threat unless you are knocked down, even if an effect says otherwise. <laughs> Great. All right, if that's the worst of it, I'll be pretty happy here. The monster lands on its belly and begins to slide on its teeth. Turn the monster directly away from the attacker and full move forward in a straight line. On, uh, on collision, non-deaf survivors gain one random disorder in addition to normal collision rules. No one's going to be in front of him. This is wonderful. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. He is out of there. All right, there is our Screaming Antelope on the very far distant side of the board. I, do I regret not taking him out when I have the chance? Ooh. Actually, we would have gotten that uh, trap either way, I believe. All right, our Antelope moves into his next activation and we have Stomp and Snort again. Random survivor in range. Looks like it's going to have to be uh, Ceres over there. Roll the dice. We want a one, two, or a three. A three, yes, we nail this. Um, so if it was a four plus, we would uh, be intimidating the target. This one is the screaming antelope begins to stomp and snort excitedly. A gurgled moan sounds from its undermouth, but we rolled that three, which means no further effect. Wonderful, okay. Next up, we check Diabolical. Uh, do we have survivors in the trample zone? Yes, we do. So we're gonna turn this guy around and he's going to move. Uh, seven spaces forward, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which of course is going to put him just out of range to do any further damage. Oh. All right, back into the activation. Eva's going to stand up at the beginning of the survivor's turn here, shuffling up that hit location deck. All right, we'll begin with um, a series up the back there. She's already harvested that. She's going to move across one here and she's going to attempt to harvest. We'll roll a dice for her. Oh no, she suffers one arm damage as well and we will discard that terrain. Next, we will spend one of her survival to move her just behind the antelope. Finally, we will spend a second point of survival for her to surge and thus get an attack in. Four dice, four plus. One, two, three hits. All right, first off, we have the Restless Hoof, which has a failure on it there. We have Giant Teeth, a super dense location, and the Giant Mouth, which also has a failure. All right, we will wound in this order here. Starting with the Giant Teeth, we are going to need what? Four plus to wound here. Giant Teeth first. A six, we do make it. It's our first wound, giant mouth, four plus. 
Oh, what are you, a seven? Nailed that one there. Now this has a reflex on it, let's check that out. If attacking with a melee weapon and the wound result for this location is a one or a two, the monster consumes your weapon, archive the gear and cancel the attack. If attacking with fist and tooth suffer the dismembered severe arm injury, none of that occurs because we're awesome. And then we've got the restless hoof for the third. Yes, we do make that as well. We don't have to resolve that failure. That is three wounds, and that leaves our Screaming Antelope with zero cards in his AI deck. We are almost done. We move into Eva's activation, and before she goes too far, she's just gonna see if she can harvest that Arcanthus from underneath the, uh, the Antelope there. Let's roll. What is that? A five, nothing flash. She finds something tasty, gaining one survival. We archive that terrain. Not bad there, guys. I'm gonna be a bit ballsy here. We're going to surge and use her activation to harvest potentially from that nightmare tree. Two, oh, not good there, I don't think. Let's check it out. Here we go. Um, snagged on a thorn, filled with angry ants, suffer one arm damage. Oh, gain one lonely ant, vermin resource. Worth it. That's her light wound for the arm there, but we gain this guy here. Archive this to swap your insanity and survival values. That may come in handy in a pinch. We are now going to use her final surge, her free surge that she gains and she's going to use it in a melee attack. Oh, but before we do that, we're gonna move her into the blind spot because we are that kind of cautious, not super cautious that we need to attack twice, but cautious enough to move into the blind spot. Two dice, five plus, two fives, two hits, come on, no traps, no traps, no traps. Restless shank and yes, restless rump. Both of these have reflexes. We're gonna go for the restless rump here, guys. We need a three plus. And we get the critical wound. Gain one screaming antelope resource. Another one from the pile here. We get a pelt. Thank you very much. What's our reflex? A beautiful job there, team. It's nice to have a light-hearted, fun encounter in Kingdom Death. I mean, it's always fun, but you don't have to, like, die of stress mid-roll when you're fighting this guy at this point. Yeah, we maybe could have gone the level three, but honestly, I don't have much experience fighting that guy. And we were just really in it for the resources. I mean, look at our fist of resources that we scored here just from the hunt, just from scavenging. Yes, I know we prioritize the scavenging a little bit, but I think we had to. We're at this point where resources are really, well, I mean, resources always matter. Anyway, this is what we did today. We managed to get out of it mostly unscathed, a couple of disorders floating around, but we, yeah, we survived well enough. As a result of our awesomeness, we gained two hunt XP for each of our survivors which means both series and series and this here are going to be experiencing their very first age milestone. So let's resolve them real quick. All right, I've got the book just down here. Um, they're gonna be both rolling for weapon proficiency. Um, since they've reached this milestone, they're now allowed to pick uh, weapon proficiencies that they can work on throughout the game. This is fantastic, but um, they also get to roll and hopefully gain some uh, ability here. So let's roll, see how they go. We'll begin with Dis, who scores a 10, and that is one random fighting art. And he scores Rhythm Chaser. Uh, this is a good one to have if you've got no heavy gear floating around. On arrival, gain plus one evasion token. When you are knocked down, if you don't have an instrument in your gear grid, remove all your plus one evasion tokens. Rhythm Chaser cannot be used if there is any heavy gear in your grid. So he's going to be the, uh, the carrier of our Whisker Harp from now on, it looks like. And then we've got Ceres over there, so let's roll for her. And that is a two and a 10, 12. She too will gain a random fighting art. Add everything back in. And we get Unconscious Fighter. It takes seven bleeding tokens to kill you. Nice. We haven't had much problem with bleeding tokens, so I'm, 
I may have preferred a permanent stat boost, but we'll take it. Excellent job there, though. Apart from that, though, we are about done. We've just got to reap the rewards of our hunt in the form of basic resources and some antelope resources to top us off. All right, first off, um, I don't think I've ever gone through this, but this is pretty important to note. When the monster is defeated, any survivors with 20 or more insanity are driven mad by the monster's death wail. They vanish, screaming into the darkness, never to be seen again. Um, that's, no one's got anywhere near that at the moment, but it is just worth mentioning that that is a drawback from the, uh, the Screaming Antelope encounter. We do gain six basic and seven Screaming Antelope resources. Our six basic will be a skull, monster hide, three is monster bone, four monster hide, five monster bone, six monster bone. We have plenty of bone now. This is very cool. Add that to our pile. Next, we gain seven Screaming Antelope resources. Whoa. The bladder. Nice, we haven't had that before. Pelt. Three, beast steak. Four, pelt. Five, pelt. Six, shank bone. And seven, shank bone as well. Wow, I love this encounter. Look at all this stuff. Let's take it on home and cash it all in. Well done, team. All right, so we take it on home. We have all four returning survivors. Unfortunately, we only gained three, and I can't remember who it was, but they're not contributing to our endeavors. Hang on. That's right, Dis has post-traumatic stress disorder, which means he cannot endeavor and cannot contribute any endeavors this settlement round. Now we're going to try and clear this up by having him skip the next hunt. In doing so, he will get to remove that disorder from his disorders and life will be good again. So we have three to play around with. We move into Lantern Year 15. Wow, this is awesome. Um, so there's not heaps to do here. Just going to draw one settlement card. I'll shuffle up, hope for the best. Up, and we draw Elder Council. This is a new one. Um, let's fix focus. The elders of the settlement gather to reminisce over their hard-won scars. Count the total number of hunt XP among all survivors and add the bonuses and consult the table. <laughs> um, wow, we have a ton of hunt XP, I'm sure. Hang on, let me find some gear. Um, let me find some character cards, hang on. All right, here is my pile of stuff here. I'm gonna work out who we've got. If I counted correctly, we are on about 103, if we're including a retired survivor. I'm pretty sure I didn't pick any of our dead survivors. Let me just double check. Yeah, wow. So um, we kind of skipped through a lot of this stuff here, which is slightly unfortunate. Um, the, the one 21 to 50 would have been wonderful, but that's okay. We get 100 plus. You may spend one endeavor. If you do, the council passes its wisdom on. Nominate a survivor with one or less hunt XP and give them an age one and age two event. That survivor may gain these benefits again when they reach their hunt XP milestones. I mean, don't get me wrong, that is pretty cool, but if we had that mid-range one there, we, would, we could add a legendary monster. How cool would that be? Uh, alas, not to worry. <laughs> Uh, look, I have one survivor in mind who looks to be growing pretty strong. Uh, they have currently the Zero Presence Fighting Art, which gives them um, pretty much anywhere they attack from, they act as though they're in the, uh, the monster's blind spot. So let's beef them up a little bit. They don't currently have a name, haven't been on any fights or anything like that. Survivor number 20. Um, if you get in and see this video and you want to pitch a name, please go ahead. Um, but yeah, Survivor 20, let's give them an age one and an age two. We might, um, we might do that when we actually build the character sheet. But yeah, that is um, a pretty cool event. I really like that. All right, so that cost us one endeavor, which means we have two left to play around with. We've updated the timeline. We haven't had any deaths. Uh, we're on to the development stage and we have a ton of uh, resources to endeavor with. So let me have a look and see how we go with that. All right, I've sussed it out guys, and this is going to be a big day of spending. I've been looking forward to this for so long. Okay, let's start off 
at the organ grinder. Here, we're going to cash in that fresh Arcanthus that we just scored for some dried Arcanthus. This stuff comes in, very much comes in handy if it's used correctly, but that's where we're starting. Next spot is we're heading to the leather worker and we're gonna spend one of our endeavors at leather making. And we're gonna spend any number of hide to add an equal number of leather strange resources to the settlement storage. Now I'm gonna cash in all my hide, uh, which by my calculations will leave me with two hide left over. So assuming I get everything right here, these two pelts will turn into hide that I'm going to store in resource storage until we need them again, all right? That makes sense. Let's just add that over here, make sure it's still around so remember. All right, let's go. At the bone smith, we're going to get a bone sickle because I really like farming and I wanna get more Arcanthus. Maybe I should use the pickaxe, but maybe not. Let's go the sickle and we're gonna cash in a monster bone and a hide which we're turning into a lever. Bang, there it is. All right, that out of the way. Next, we head to the stone circle. And first things first, we got our bladder and we've got an organ, so let's cash them in. We have paint for blood paint. This is gonna be crazy. So blood paint, we use our activation. We may activate weapon gear to the left and right of this card. These are two separate attacks, cannot be used with two-handed weapons. This is like two attacks for the price of one. This is. Amazing, I'm so happy we have the bladder now. Oh, let's bring that back. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Stay. We're actually gonna cash in, uh, where are we? One pelt and one large flat tooth for the beast knuckles. I didn't realize these were catars. I need another one of these, but I didn't have another large flat tooth. Um, so that's pretty sweet as well. This is a two speed, uh, hits on a six plus, has a four strength, but it has the paired ability. So when you, um, if you had another one of these in the gear grid, you could add the speed of the two together and attack this thing is just boss. It also has this other ability. When you wound with this weapon, monster gains minus one toughness until end of the attack. Oh, love it. Next up. The big one we have all been waiting for, right? We are going to finish off our Phoenix armor set. First off, we've got the Phoenix Pauls. This one here, this will cost one iron, a leather, tail feather, and an organ. We have it all here. Cash them in, keep the Pauls. Um, these are a four armor location. When you depart, gain plus one insanity. Super useful. Next up, we have the Phoenix Gauntlet, which require iron, leather, small feathers, and a bone. There we are for those. Lovely. That's that uh, black skull that we got from the Phoenix a little while ago. This counts as an iron if we wanted to. I don't think there's any, anything else we need to use it for, so that one's solid. The Phoenix Gauntlet's here. Four armor yet again, when you depart, gain one further insanity. Beautiful. Last but not least, the Phoenix Greaves. Four armor, if insane, gain plus two movement. Absolutely brutal. This one will cost one iron, one leather, small feather, organ. I have the, uh, the leather, the small feather, and the organ here. And we have one iron left on our resource storage. So I'll get rid of that. Awesome. Guys, did we kill it today or did we kill it? That is amazing. All right, so we've used that endeavor. We've got our two pelts that we converted into leather. I'm just gonna mark them on our resource storage. And one last thing we may as well do. We have one more endeavor left. We have monster hide, monster bones, and a questionable resource for our organ, mainly because we have other organs that I don't wanna use. Let's innovate again. All right, so I'll shuffle up our deck. We are going to draw four here. And, oh, I've obviously got a screaming armor stuck in there. Let's not do that. All right, we ready, guys? Four. We get a bed. <laughs> Go to bed. Sculpture, family, partnership. I'm gonna tell you right now, we are going for family, but let's check them out. So first off, we have partnership. We may spend two endeavors here, nominate two survivors, they pair off and each gains the partner ability. A survivor may be nominated for partners once a lifetime. When you have partner, 
Uh, when you both arrive, gain survival up to the survival limit. Partners may only nominate each other for intimacy. When a partner dies, the remaining partner gains a random disorder and loses this ability. Family. Departing survivors gain plus one survival. Survivors nominated for intimacy may give themselves a surname if they do not have one. A newborn survivor inherits the surname of one of the parents, their weapon type, and half rounded down of their weapon proficiency levels. I love this one. You'll see why shortly. Sculpture. Uh, you can spend an endeavor to create an inspirational statue. This is kind of cool, actually. Um, skip the next hunt and lose a fighting art. Record this fighting art on the settlement record sheet. A settlement can have only one inspirational statue. You can also spend an endeavor to study the inspirational statue. Roll 1d10 on a 6+, plus, gain the recorded fighting art. Love that one as well. Then we have bed. Um, add one to the survival limit. You may spend an endeavor to rest here. Um, on a one to three, you gain insanity, which is still cool. On a four plus, you can um, you start to recover injuries like broken arm, broken hip, broken rib, ruptured muscle, severe injury. This would also come in very much in handy, but for me, it's going to be family because, 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 because we have a survivor named Bastion. He has the Twilight Sword. And um, without, I'm gonna kind of spoil it. If he gains one more weapon proficiency, he's going to leave the settlement and do Twilight Knight things out there. And he can pass the sword down to another member of the, um, another member of the settlement. What this doesn't allow us to do, we can't actually pass on the fighting art itself unless we have family. So we need this so we can get a new Twilight Knight and make sure they're ready to fight the Watcher up in the day. Anyway, that is super exciting to have here. Absolutely love it. Um, next, we prepare our departing survivors for their next hunt. I think it's time to take on another lion. It's been a little while since we've done one of those guys. So yeah, that's it for our settlement. Good job. Legit though, I love the screaming antelope. <laughs> He's so generous to us and he doesn't even try and kill us very often. It's fantastic. Um, let's just, just a quick recap. That hunt phase was amazing. We completely jagged it getting a random hunt event uh, after overwhelming darkness. We got to use Eva's ability to take us all the way to that 100 and to that Cyclops. And oh, that was a, that could have been a disastrous event for us, but we managed to roll pretty well and we scored that steel shield and steel sword. I cannot wait to use them on the field. I, I don't even know how it's gonna integrate with the gear that we've already got. Um, what kills me about that event though, is there was a nine or a 10 that we could have rolled, which would have given us something immeasurably powerful and we're gonna have to rely on dumb luck getting us back there we are not able to use Eva um, yeah <laughs> I hope we make it this run but there's always another run guys there's always another run uh, the antelope was fantastic today he was just chilling stomping his feet letting us sort of run around picking up Arcanthus yes we only got one Arcanthus but there was a slew of all this other cool stuff that we got when we finally took him down we scored all these bonus resources which I love. Thank you, Mr. Screaming Antelope. He does us the best, except for the Gregolope. He's even more generous. Anyway, we took all that back and we built all this new amazing stuff. We've finally got our Phoenix gear. We've got the Dry Arcanthus. Ah, oh, it's a big celebration, this one. <laughs> Anyway, aside from all of that actual Kingdom Death stuff, I hope you enjoyed the inclusion of a backing track behind our showdown phase, just to add a little bit of spooky ambience so you can't hear my air conditioner. <laughs> anyway, um, next episode we're into Lantern Year 15, uh, a massive milestone for us. I think we're going to take on the White Lion, because I'm pretty sure there's still a few things in the Katarium that we haven't built, and I want to build everything. <laughs> Um, as for what level, level 2 is going to be pretty comfortable for us. Level 3 he looks super powerful. Now I don't know if we're actually ready for level 3 stuff, but uh, I do want to hear what you guys think about that, whether it's worth, you know, the risk 
and reward and bragging rights, let's be real. Uh, aside from that, guys, we're all about done here. Uh, as always, if you've enjoyed yourself, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, do all of those amazing YouTube things, because it allows our channel to grow, and it's only going to mean more content later on down the track. Um, that being said, though, guys, we are done. Thank you very, very much for watching. Absolutely love you guys. As always, my name is Michael. This is Bits Aboard. We'll catch you next time.